1 Corinthians 15, we'll begin reading verse 54. The Bible says, So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Our Father, we sure do bless you. Thank you for the good singing. Lord, our hearts were blessed by the singing. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done in our lives. Lord, your name is above every name that's ever been spoken. And Lord, thank you for the new robe of righteousness that we now don, that Lord, you purchased with your own blood, and you robed us in when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Father, I pray you'd help us tonight from the scriptures. I pray you'd open our minds and even more importantly, open our hearts to thy truth. May the word of God be received with gladness. And then may we not be hearers of the word only, but help us to become doers of the word of God. Help us, Lord, to uh, live an elevated life above the rudiments of this world, that others may see Christ in us and desire the same hope of glory that we have tonight. Now, Father, I pray, certainly, if there's any amongst us that are not saved, that tonight would be the night of their salvation. For those that are saved, Lord, I realize that the world is contrary to us, the flesh is contrary to us, and even the sorry no good devil. And Lord, there is a, a battle between the spiritual man, that inner man, and the outer man. And so, Father, I pray that we would work out our salvation. I pray we'd be filled with the Spirit of God. I pray that, Lord, we would uh, have the fruit of the Spirit developed in our life. And, God, may we truly desire to be Christ-like. Now, bless, use this unworthy vessel. Certainly touch those that are sick, those that are providentially hindered, our special prayer request, those that typically would be here but are not here tonight. God, I pray you'd bless them and help them. Help us tonight to be seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We'll thank you for it. For it's in the holy name of the Lord Jesus we ask it all. Amen and amen. I want to draw your attention to this text uh, and uh, build a foundation for us to get to the thought. I want you to notice, first of all, that through these verses we find that death is devoured. Look again in verse number 54. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. You and I tonight, we live in the flesh. We are wrapped in a corruptible body. But there is coming a day when the Lord is going to take us out of this world and this corruptible body will put on an incorruptible body. This mortal body will put on immortality. Uh, and when that takes place, uh, we find this saying will come to pass that death will be devoured. Death uh, is swallowed up in victory. Uh, uh, tonight, uh, as uh, born-again believers, uh, we may uh, not be looking forward to death. We may even fear death. And... That is a natural reaction. The Bible makes it clear that death is the king of terrors. Uh, but you and I that are saved have a blessed hope beyond the grave. Uh, we know that uh, as children of God, that uh, uh, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Uh, and one reason that you may be uh, apprehensible about death or fear death uh, is it's not your time to die. Uh, but I have uh, read enough and been around enough folks that are ready to cross over and there's something uh, called dying grace. Uh, I'm glad God has grace for everything we'll ever face. Uh, but friend, if you're not facing it, you don't need the grace. Uh, but I promise you when that time comes, uh, God will not fail you. There will be grace. Uh, 
But dear friend, uh, listen, uh, when we get to the other side and we get a body fastened like the darling Son of God, uh, we'll fear no death no more because there will be no more death. Uh, and our death will be swallowed up in victory. Uh, and we will, my dear friends, uh, shout the victory on the other side. Uh, I want you to notice death is devoured. Uh, I want you to notice the destruction of darts. Look in verse number 55. The Bible says this, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? We find that there are darts that attack people, but those darts too will be destroyed. Hosea said it this way in Hosea 13, 14, I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. O death, I will be thy plagues. O grave, I will be thy destruction. Repentance shall be hid from mine eyes. Can I say the Lord Jesus was the very plague and terror to death. He's the one that overcame death. He's the one that resurrected under his own power. And as a result, the sting of death will be removed from believers. And death will not destroy our bodies, our inner man. We will overcome death because he overcame death. The very sting of death has been destroyed. What a blessing to know that. Hmm. Uh, I've got a book some of you have borrowed it over the years it talks about the last words of sinners and saints uh, Christians die different than lost people Amen. because there is no sting of death we see death devoured we see the destruction of the darts but notice the dagger defined in verse number 56 it says the sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law could I say tonight that the reason mm, that there is no sting of death for the child of God is in the eyes of God we have no more sin our sins have been washed in the blood of Christ you've heard me tell you the past sin the present sin and the future sin are gone they have been uh, eradicated by the blood of Jesus Christ. Uh, now, in my flesh, I still fail God in sin, uh, but God doesn't see me in my flesh. Uh, he sees the inner man that's sealed unto the day of redemption. Uh, he sees me robed in his righteousness. Uh, he sees me justified by faith. Uh, and when he looks at me, he sees himself. Uh, and I bless the name of the Lord. Uh, and therefore, that dagger, that sting uh, of death has been removed for the child of God. Uh, but notice the dagger is defined in this verse. It says, the sting of death is sin. And the strength of sin is the law. Now that sounds very contrary. We think the law, the word of God is holy. We don't think of it as the strength of sin. But listen what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 7, verse number 9. For I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life I found to be unto death. For sin taking occasion by the commandment deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. He goes on to expound in, in, on it in Romans 4.15, Because the law worketh wrath, for where no law is, there is no transgression. Can I say that the strength of sin is the law? Before you heard the law of God, the word of God, you did not know you were accountable to sin. You didn't know what sin was. So the strength of sin is the law. Once you heard the law, you became under condemnation to sin. 
And that's what Paul's saying in Romans chapter 7 and what he clarifies uh, throughout his teachings uh, that without the law we had no knowledge of sin uh, but through the law uh, we became accountable to sin so the strength of sin is the law. It shows us we're guilty before God. Uh, we see, my dear friends, the dagger was defined in verse 6. Sin. And the strength of sin was the law. But then notice the deliverance demonstrated in verse 57. The Bible says this, But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Can I say that without the Lord, the darts and the daggers would overcome us and we'd die and go to hell. But we have victory through the Lord Jesus Christ. And we see the deliverance is demonstrated uh, not in our works, not in our abilities, not in our intellect, uh, but through Jesus Christ. Uh, what He did in the finished works of Calvary uh, when He bled and died for our sins and was buried and rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Uh, he demonstrated the deliverance uh, and the way out for you and I. Uh, and when we got born again, we died out to sin and were raised in newness of life. Uh, he came to give us life and life more abundantly. Uh, and through Him we have the victory. Uh, the Bible says in Colossians chapter 2 and verse number 10. Listen now. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom uh, also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, uh, in putting off the body of the sins uh, of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Brother Clint sang about it, putting off the old robe, uh, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him, uh, through the faith of the operation of God uh, who hath raised him from the dead uh, and you being dead in your sins uh, and the uncircumcision of your flesh uh, hath he quickened or made alive quickened together with him uh, having forgiven you all trespasses uh, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us uh, which was contrary to us and took it out of the way uh, nailing it to his cross uh, now listen to verse 15 uh, having spoiled principalities and powers, uh, he made a show of them openly, triumphing, triumphing over them in it. Uh, uh, through the Lord Jesus Christ, we have the victory. Uh, he demonstrated the deliverance uh, and the way out. Uh, and what a blessing tonight. Uh, we don't have to die in our sins. We can be saved. And those of us that are saved, uh, we ought to shout the victory. Uh, we don't get what we deserve. Uh, we get glory and grace uh, because of the Lord Jesus Christ. And what a blessing to be saved tonight. but we sure don't look like a victorious people. Amen. Huh? A lot of us look like that road hard and put away wet people. Hmm? Amen. Now, I didn't see anything about the game. I don't follow many games anymore. They've ruined sports. Money's ruined it all. But I did see where, I guess, Cincinnati won a big game last night and the student section stormed the court. Kind of looked like they had some victory. How come we're not storming the church house tonight? Mm -hmm. Amen. Because maybe we don't realize the victory that we have. And I want to preach with God's help tonight on this thought. I want to preach on the victorious Christian life. The victorious Christian life. Can I say that victory doesn't always look like what most people think victory is? Yeah, amen. Can I say that the storming of the court lasted but for a moment. But I wonder if they'll be that happy when they show up at the court at the next game. So what momentary joy they had was not very sustaining, was it? Right. 
especially when they play Louisville, I guess. I don't even know if they play Louisville anymore. Huh? Louisville's not very good anymore, are they? <laughs> I noticed you didn't shout much when I was talking about that. Huh? <laughs> huh? Kentucky looked like the real deal to the other day. Huh? What are you trying to say? Isn't it amazing how circumstances dictate whether or not people have victory? Amen. But not so in the Christian life. So let me give you some things on the victorious Christian life. Can I say? The victorious Christian life is one of triumph. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, it says, Now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ, and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. Now, how many of you believe the word of God is true? Amen. How many of you believe every word of God is true? Amen. Well, if you believe that, the Bible says, Now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ. Right. Did you feel like you won the victory today over anything? Did you come in like Daffy Duck going, woohoo, woohoo, glory? But the Bible says we always triumph in Christ. Amen. Hmm? Can I say the Bible is always cr true and the victorious Christian life is one of triumph. Whether or not you're on the mountain or in the valley, we are triumphing in Christ. You remember what you used to be without Christ? Remember the life you used to have before Christ? Uh, you remember what happened when you found out about Christ? Uh, and you remember when you was under conviction to get saved uh, and how miserable and how uh, 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 you just couldn't believe it and it couldn't be true? Uh, uh, but you remember when you got saved and the peace and the joy and the love that flooded your life? Uh, uh, my dear friend, uh, what we were before Christ was not triumphant. Uh, but after we've gotten saved, we are triumphant in all things whether or not it's going our way or not. Amen. Because how many of you believe Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father? Amen. How many of you believe He ever liveth to make intercession for us? Uh, how many of you believe there's one mediator between God and man? How many of you believe that Christ is Lord of Lords and King of Kings? Uh, how many of you believe He's made us a king and priest in Him? Uh, how many of you believe that we are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus? Uh, uh, what you've got to understand, uh, uh, my dear friend, uh, uh, one, day, one of these days, this here is going to catch up with what's already there. What's already there is triumphant. Uh, Amen. And we are triumphant in Him. Amen, Pastor. See, one of these days, the practical, what we are now, it's going to catch up with our positional. And our positional is always triumphant. Hmm? And we're always triumphant in Christ. The problem is, is we tend to look at the situations we're involved in and we listen to the sorry no good flesh, the sorry no good devil, and the sorry no good world that tells us we are not successful, therefore we believe them rather than the Bible. Hmm? Amen. I've used this illustration before. If I've got this right in front of me, guess what all I see? Right. You know what most of our problem is? We carry most of our problems right here. Yeah. No. And we don't do this. Oh. And see that we have the victory in Christ Jesus. A victorious Christian life is one of triumph. Hmm? Amen. We've already won the victory. Yeah. You've heard it said many a time. We can read the back of the book and see we've won. I've got news for you. I don't even have to get to the back of the book. I've already won because I'm not lost uh, in my sins on my way to hell. Right. <laughs> the victorious Christian life is one of triumph. Can I say this? And here's where we have a problem because you've listened to Joe Wolstein too much. The Christian life is also one of trials. Yes, sir. And somewhere in our little pea brains, because we face things uh, that is not uh, convenient to our flesh, we think God doesn't care, and we think that we're not the Christian we ought to be. 
How many of you have ever really felt like a sorry, no good Christian? Amen. Give me chapter and verse for that. Do you know His mercies are renewed every day? Hmm? Has there ever been a moment you have not been engraved in the palm of the Lord's hand since you got saved? Has there ever been a time that Jesus Christ has not been real in your life? Oh, do we fail God? Yes. But are we failures? No. Going through a trial does not mean that you are a second-class Christian. Quite the opposite most of the time. It means God is entrusting you so you can impact somebody else by the way you handle your trial. How am I to handle my trial? I, I have victory. Hmm? Amen. This is what the Bible says about trials. Peter, who knew a little bit about trials? Peter's one that beat his chest and said, Lord, I'll die with you. The Lord said, you're going to deny me. No, not me. Yeah, he did. Hmm? Uh, Peter's the one that popped off the mouth. All the Peter's the one the Lord called Satan. He said, get thee behind me, Satan. Now, how would you like the Lord to look at you and call you Satan? He did Peter. But you know, after John chapter 20, Peter's different. Peter learned to trust in the Lord. He overcame some things, and you never see the same guy after that. Matter of fact, it was Peter who preached on the day of Pentecost and 3,000 souls were added to the church. And Peter that writes First and Second Peter is a whole lot different than the fellows following, following the Lord around while he was on the earth. This is what Peter says. He said, Beloved, he's talking to saved people, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. Hmm? Just because you're going through a trial don't mean you're a second-class Christian. doesn't mean God doesn't care. Listen to what he said in, in 1 Peter 1, 7. That the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth it. He says, you having your faith tried is more precious than gold. He goes on to say, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Now, how many of you would like to say, I want my life to bring glory to God? Yes. Amen. Well, in order to do that, you're going to have to go through some trials. Right. And those trials, when we go through them, realizing we already have the victory in Christ Jesus, those trials bring glory to God. Hmm? Listen, if it was all uh, nothing but rose petals to walk on, uh, and it was nothing but smooth sailing, uh, and it was nothing but Midas's touch, and everything we touched turned to gold, everybody would want to be a Christian because of the perks. Uh, but listen, uh, when you still serve God regardless of the fiery trial, uh, and you still bring Him glory, uh, not only with your lips, but with your life, uh, Friends, it shows the world what you have is real and you are victorious. Hmm? Nobody wants to be a loser. Some of the most impactful stories and movies and shows we've ever seen is when David slays Goliath. When the impossible is done through somebody you'd never think could do it. Well, isn't that what God does in our life every day when we overcome trials and show this world what we have is real? Yeah. You have that, but do you live that? Thanks be unto God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible goes on to say this in 2 Timothy 3, 12, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You're going to face some tough times. I got news for you. The world's facing tough times too. But they don't have the victory. Hmm? Why do we want to act like the world? We ought to inspire the world to trust Christ. We will if we realize we have a victorious Christian life. Hmm? Listen, Paul prefaced everything about trials in this in 2 Timothy 3 and verse 10. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, 
faith, long-suffering, charity, patient. I mean, Paul says, you've known me. You've known everything I've faced. You've known what I was before I got saved. You've seen my life since I've got saved. You know my doctrine. You know where I stand on the Bible. You know my manner of life and how I carry myself. You know my purpose, what drives me. You've seen my faith. You see how I've been long-suffering, not quick-tempered, long-suffering. You've seen my charity, my love and compassion for folks. You've seen my patience. Then he goes on, verse 11, he says, you've seen my persecutions. Paul was stoned three times, or stoned, he was beaten three times, uh, he was in prison, he faced all kinds of things, uh, left for dead. Uh, he said, you've seen my persecutions, uh, you've seen my afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch and Iconium and Lystra, what p persecutions I endured. Uh, now here it is, but out of them all, the Lord delivered me. Amen. Thanks be unto God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. What's he saying? He's saying trials come, but the Lord's greater than our trials. And if we keep that in perspective when trials come, it's no longer, woe is me, it's no longer, God's not for me, uh, God's not hearing my prayers, uh, I'm a sorry no Christian. Uh, uh, it's look, uh, I don't know what God's a doing, uh, but He's a doing something for His glory. Uh, instead of being an obstacle or a stumbling block, now it's a stepping stone uh, for God to use our lives and to get glory because we've already got victory. Amen. What's the worst thing that can happen? It takes your life, you end up in heaven. What's, what's wrong with that? Amen. It's all about perspective. Here's the problem with most Christians. They don't have victory. Because when things come, they look down. Instead of looking up. Can I say the victorious Christian life is one of triumph. It's one of trials. It's also one of tears. Preacher Moore, do you know Dennis Petty? How many know Dennis Petty or remember Dennis Petty? It's been a long time since he's been here. <laughs> I've never met a man, a preacher like Dennis Petty. Brother Dennis has probably been preaching 60 years. Brother Dennis can take one word and bring that word to life from the Scriptures. I mean, when he preaches, I don't even take notes. I just sit there with my mouth open. Huh? Me and Sidney Weaver, we can't wait. We'll see him this next week. When Brother Dennis gets up, we just sit there. We, we don't even, we just close the Bible. We just sit there and just soak it up like a sponge. Because Dennis has that walk with the Lord. And he brings things out like you wouldn't believe. But Dennis, like some other preachers I know, is a weeping preacher. He's just so tender hearted while he's bringing out things about grace or glory or whatever he's teaching, it touches our, he's known to shed a tear or two. I've heard preachers persecute him because he has the audacity to weep. The Bible says Jesus wept. John eleven thirty five. 35, that's what every kid wants to memorize in Sunday school. Give me that verse. But Dennis Petty, first time he came here, he preached on the grace of God. I refused to preach on it for a solid year after that. Well, there's no way I could touch what he did. But he wept. I know other preachers that weep, and I've heard some of these old hard shell, hard hearted, pharisaical preachers. Well, shouldn't be. I heard a man once say, if your head leaks, it won't swell. Amen. Amen. Uh, but can I say, as a child of God, you're going to you're gonna have some weeping days. Sure. The Bible says in Acts 20 and 31, Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. If the Apostle Paul wept over people in their soul, who are we not to? 
In 2 Timothy 1.4, Paul writing to Timothy says, Greatly desire to see thee, being mindful of thy tears, that I may be filled with joy. Paul knew Timothy was weeping. He said, just desiring to see you, I'm filled with joy. He says, but I'm mindful of your tears. Now, I don't know. It doesn't go on to tell us what burden Timothy had, but the Apostle Paul knew about it. In Psalms 126.5, they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. Maybe we don't see many people saved today because we don't weep over their souls. Of course, in Psalms 30 and 5, the last part of that verse says, Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Can I say when we think about victory, we don't think about shedding tears and weeping and being broken. But can I say this? God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. The true victorious Christian life is one that has watered the garden with tears. Hmm. Can I say, a victorious Christian life is one of tasks. You can't have victory sitting around doing nothing. Amen. Psalms 100 verse 2 says, Serve the Lord with gladness, come before His presence with singing. Can I say, serving the Lord should not be a detriment. It ought to be a joy. Amen. Because we don't deserve to get to serving and those that serve him in the right spirit, they find it's a true joy. Hmm? You all know, I used to have a big corporate job. And when I left that job, the owner of the company looked at me and he said, why would you leave all of this? I said, because rare is it in life that you get to do your passion." Now, here's the irony of it all. When I walked out of that company, it was worth $40 million. In three years, they filed bankruptcy. Last I heard, the owner of that company was selling used furniture out of a warehouse and over the Rhine. Not the best of neighborhoods. I'm still doing my passion. Mm -hmm. Going on 30 years, I'm still doing my passion. And he's bankrupt. Worse than that, he's lost. Hmm. Can I say? You find joy in serving the Lord. The happiest you will ever be is the busiest you are for the Lord. How many have heard this old proverb, an idle mind's the devil's workshop? The devil wants to put everybody on an island. He wants to isolate you, get you away from the flock. We find in Luke 15, the, the parable of the lost sheep. The Lord left the 99 searching for the one. Why did he leave the 99? They were safe. They were established. They were together. Uh, but the one by itself, he's prey. And if the devil can isolate you and fill your mind with a bunch of junk, you won't live a victorious Christian life. You'll live a defeated Christian life. And that's where a lot of folks are and maybe some of you tonight hmm? fill your mind with the word of God fill your heart with a song for God Amen. fill your life with a fervent prayer life fill your life with the things of God and you'll find victory everywhere you look would you sit there and let the devil fill your mind full of a bunch of junk you know what you're going to be? Dragon. I don't know if any of you will know this name. There was a great preacher in the South. Lord have mercy. Mays Jackson been dead almost and probably going on 30 years now. Mays Jackson, anybody ever heard his name? I know, I know you Southerners have. Well, Brother Bob, he's kind of a southerner. He's from Texas, be Ohio, Indiana. He's everywhere. He's been everywhere, man. Huh? Mays Jackson was a powerful evangelist, pastor, and preacher. I mean, just powerful. God's hand was on him. Used greatly in the South. 
and he preached a revival and really nothing happened I mean he preached his heart out not much movement at all nobody got saved nobody really got right the church was in the same shape when he left as it was when he got there so he got in his car Friday night had a long drive headed home just feeling like he was a failure because nothing happened he was the preacher well lo and behold the devil got to praying on that oh you're no good you spent time away from your family look you didn't do no good you didn't help those people just I mean just pouring it on him and he's listening to every word of it and finally about an hour and a half up the road he took all he was going to take he pulled off the side of the road got out opened the door and said devil get out of here I've listened to you enough I, I'm, there are no more free rides and he got back in his car and he went on down next meeting God showed up big a lot of folks got saved you say what are you talking about sometimes we just need to open the door of our minds and say devil get out of here I'm done with you the best way to do that is just start pleading the blood of the Lord the devil hates that huh just uh, start singing about the Lord just go back to where the Lord saved you and start thinking about that for a little bit hey those thoughts will flee you for a season because he tempted the Lord in the wilderness and it said he left him he departed from him for a season oh he'll come back just take him back to the blood take him back to where you got saved he'll leave you alone but see if you entertain him and you listen to him you're going to come in like some of you came in tonight. When you're busy for the Lord, you don't have time to listen to the devil. Amen. The victorious Christian life is one of tasks. Can I say this? The victorious Christian life is one of thorns. Now, Many times throughout the scriptures, thorns are a picture of the judgment of God. Even our darling Lord wore a crown of thorns. But thorns are also an instrument God will use in our lives to keep us on the victory path. The great Apostle Paul gives us a great example in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. You know the story, verse 7. He said, And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations... See, God showed Paul things that Paul wasn't even permitted to talk about for, for 10 years, and 15 years. Some was never permitted to talk about. He got caught up in the third heaven. We talk about John seeing the, everything that's about to, So did Paul. And Paul got to see things that he, you know, he was even afraid to talk about. And God showed him things, and God revealed. I mean, he wrote a, a, a vast majority of the New Testament. I mean, you're talking about somebody that could have went on an ego trip. But he said, lest I should be exalted above measure because of these abundance of revelations. He said, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the, the Lord thrice, that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. You know what Paul said? Paul said, I found victory in my thorns. I found grace, and I found that thorn made me walk closer to God. That thorn made me uh, serve the Lord more. That thorn caused me, and Satan meant it for my harm, but God meant it for my good. Amen. He said, and I found victory in that. I've seen many a people face something, and they let that thing defeat them because they can't get victory over it. You know why you can't get victory over it? You're looking at the thorn. You're wallowing in self-pity. Paul prayed about it. The Lord said, my grace is sufficient for thee, and that was good enough for Paul. And as far as we know, he carried it to the grave. But I've got news for you. He's not carrying it anymore. 
Uh, now you might not like this. The Holy Ghost gave this to me in my office yesterday. You don't get over thorns. You just discover grace to live with them. Anybody got a scar in your body? Why don't you try wishing that thing away? No, you just learn to live with it. It's just part of you. A lot of times, the memory of how you got that scar will help you to do more intelligent things in the future. Because I know I got some dumb scars on me. Well, I thought it was something to put my leg down in front of second base when I was trying to steal second base. And so they couldn't get to the bag, and I'd tag them out, you know, when the catcher throw me the ball. But now I got all them scars from all them stupid spike marks. That was pretty dumb. Let them have the bag. Well, I got some other ones I don't like to talk about. I got a grandbaby now. She don't need to hear about that stuff. Uh, they should have never put Starsky and Hutch on TV because we tried it one time. You know the opening scenes when he's sliding across the, roof, the hood of the car? I did that one time. Jumped in the car. My buddy's driving. He's peeling out. I'm white smoking the tires. I got one hand on the door and one hand on the seat. I'm not in the car. He's burning it up. Looks over and panics. Hits the brakes. And then I went. It wasn't funny. It was kind of slow motion. Till I hit. Huh? So what happened? I still got a scar on my elbow. About ripped my arm off. You know what? I never did that again. Hmm? Never. Been 45 years ago. I've never done it again. What I'm trying to tell you is, sometimes those thorns are put in our lives that we gain wisdom and gain victory. Hmm? Let me say this. The victorious Christian life is one of trust, hope. I trust that this isn't the end. This is just the first step for forever. I have a hope that goes far beyond the temporal. The Bible says in Titus 13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. 1 John chapter 3 says this, verse 2, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him. Why? We're putting off this incorruptible, or corruptible, putting on incorruptible. Well, it says, For we shall see Him as He is. Every man that hath this hope in him, in him purify himself, even as he is pure. When you are looking for Jesus to come, guess what? You'll be living like you're looking for Jesus to come. Amen. Therefore, you purify yourself, even as he's pure. You're not going to be out living in sin when you're looking for Jesus to come. My dear friends, everybody knows he's coming. Just most people don't think he's coming today. And you say, how do you know that, preacher? They'd live a whole lot different. Right. And they'd have some victory in their life. I've said all that say this. Here's the thing that Joe Osteen doesn't understand. Here's why you face trials, you face tears, you face thorns. Here's why those things happen and you still live a victorious Christian life. Victory lies in Christ, not our circumstances. Victory is realized when we embrace Christ in the midst of our circumstances. You want to have victory? Embrace Christ. Embrace the truth of the Scriptures. The Bible says I triumph in all things. The Bible says I have victory in Jesus Christ our Lord. So therefore, I choose to be victorious, regardless of my circumstances. Hmm? It's not about confidence. It's about assurance. I have no confidence in the flesh, but I have total assurance in the Lord. Therefore, my confidence lies in Him. Now, a lot of people don't like to hear this statement, but it's a true statement. 
The devil always seems to impact weak-minded people. You know why people are weak-minded? They don't spend enough time in the Scriptures. So then faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. You know what to help your assurance? The Scriptures. Hmm? You can't read five verses a day and then deal with the devil for 24 hours of the day and think you're going to have victory. You've got to read something and then sow it in your heart and meditate on it throughout the day. You'll find you'll have victory. Hmm? When you have victory, you have joy. When you have joy, you're ready to storm the court. The courts of his house. The secrets outlined in the scriptures. Hebrews chapter 12, verse number 1. Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. Y'all remember when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead? You remember when they brought him to the tomb and the stone was rolled over the tomb and Jesus asked them to remove it? Jesus didn't put it there and he wasn't going to remove it. But he did put Lazarus in the grave and he called him forth. He let Lazarus die for the glory of God. Now what I'm trying to say is there are things that we put in our life that Jesus isn't going to remove. We have to lay aside the weight. If you know there are certain things that are going to trigger the devil working in your mind, you need to put them away. And you certainly need to put away your sin or your bad habits that leave you feeling like a second-class Christian. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Listen, Rome wasn't built in a day, and neither is a victorious Christian life. You've got to run with patience. One step at a time, you've got to keep your mind on the Lord. He goes on to tell us in verse number 2, looking at your trials, looking at your circumstances, looking at your failures. No. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Uh, for consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Uh, Listen, uh, uh, the cross was nothing joyous for the Lord physically, uh, but for the joy that was set before him. What was that joy? He looked ahead in time and saw you and I saved in him, uh, having the victory in him. Uh, therefore, he endured the cross. Uh, uh, friends, we are to consider that. Uh, we're to endure the trials, endure the tears, endure the thorns uh, for the joy set before us. What? Christ. Uh, uh, what he has for us, the whole Hope of glory. Uh, uh, and friends, when we do, we will not be wearied and faint in our minds. We will live a victorious Christian life. But if you're not looking unto Jesus, you're not considering Him, you won't live a victorious life. Romans 8. We love that chapter. Verse 34 says, Who is he that condemneth? Who makes you feel like a second-class citizen? Who makes you feel like a failure? Paul says, Is it Christ that died? Yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Is it him who condemns you? He says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep uh, uh, for the slaughter. He says, nay. It's not Christ that condemns us. He goes on to say, in all things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Sounds pretty victorious to me. He's saying in the midst of persecution and tribulation, distress, famine, nakedness, peril, sword, we're more than conquerors through Christ, him that loved us. And he goes on to say, For I'm persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You can have a victorious Christian life. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory. 
through our Lord Jesus Christ. The day you got saved, He gave you victory. And He gives you victory every day. You've just got to embrace it. You know why we play the games? Have you ever watched ESPN before a game and it tell you that, you know, Alabama's got a 97% chance to win? Why do they just call the game? You know why they play the games? Because you don't know who wins till the final whistle's blown. You know why God's mercies are new every day? So we can have victory every day. The victory's already been won in Christ. We've just got to show up and receive it. Now tonight, you can choose to live defeated or you can choose to live a victorious Christian life. It's up to you. I just choose Christ. And when you have Him, you have the victory. Let's all stand. Brother Clint, come get a song of invitation. I tell you, victory in Jesus might be a good one. Uh, God spoke to your heart. The altar's open. They're picking out that song. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. Thank you for what is provided to us through Christ. So many times we don't consider the benefits afforded us in being saved. Help us, Lord, to live a victorious Christian life. Lord, I know there are some who struggle with things. Help them to nail it down tonight and to overcome those things through Christ. And Lord, grant them that special grace they need that others can see the work of Christ in their life. Lord, get glory from our lives because Lord, you truly are glorious and we bless you for what we're afforded in you. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.